It's your boy with the curly ass hair back with some more mediocre film editing skills. I got a few requests from y'all to do a video about this here uh, 2001 Gibson Custom Shop R8 Les Paul. Coincidentally, this guitar just had its 20th birthday this year, and so I decided it would be a good idea to spend all of my government stimulus money on guitar parts because that's the sort of thing that makes my parents proud. In my last video, I swapped a set of 57 classics that were in this guitar into an Ibanez lawsuit guitar that I have. Now this is a Gibson Custom Shop historic reissue of a 1958 Les Paul standard. For those of y'all who don't know, in 1958, Gibson started manufacturing Les Pauls in a cherry sunburst finish as opposed to a gold top finish. The guitars made that way from 1958 through 1960 are now recognized as some of the best guitars ever made and what most would consider the holy grail of guitar tones, sort of like the Stradivarius violin of the electric guitar. Now I'm not going to go into depth about the history of the Les Paul or the legacy that it's created, but if you want to know more about that, there are plenty of great videos on YouTube that talk at length about that sort of thing. And a couple of channels I would recommend are Rhett Shull and 5 Watt World. What I want to talk about are some of the historic inaccuracies of the earlier Gibson Custom Shop reissue Les Pauls like this one. To say the least, there are a lot of them. These earlier 2000s Les Pauls are not very accurate to the 50s bursts. Setting aside the carve of the wood or the types of woods used, be it Brazilian rosewood or a hundred year old mahogany, which neither can be changed about this guitar, certainly not without extensive work and money to put into it, there were quite a few features about this guitar's electronics that I believe had a massive impact on the sound. <laughs> Let's take a look at the wiring harness. The first thing I noticed was that in the early 2000s, Gibson was using ceramic orange drop capacitors. Now these types of capacitors aren't terrible capacitors, they are great for certain tones, but they're not what was used in the original Les Pauls. So I ended up swapping them out for a pair of Lux Bumblebee capacitors, which to my understanding are some of the most accurate vintage spec capacitors made. Essentially what the capacitor does in your guitar is it sends the high frequency signals from the tone pot to the ground as you roll the tone pot down, basically allowing the tone pot to work as a tone pot. Theoretically, the type of capacitor you're using shouldn't really have an effect on your sound unless your tone pot is engaged. However, after switching mine out, I can tell you there's a noticeable difference even without turning the tone pot down. I don't know why, it's some voodoo sort of magic or something, I don't know, but um, it does. <laughs> quite accurate about this wiring harness were the type of pots that Gibson was using in 2001. Now for those of y'all who don't know, not all guitar pots are the same. Different types of guitar pots have different resistance levels. And typically what you want in a Gibson style guitar is a 500k pot. Now what I read was that back in 2001 Gibson had been using imported pots, which while they were rated at 500k, most of the time wouldn't actually end up reading 500k if you tested them. So what happens if you have a pot that's supposed to be 500K, but it's more like 450 or 475, is that when your pots are rolled all the way up to 10, what is 10 on a pot that's 450 is more like eight on a pot that's 
500 or 500 or more. So basically you're not getting the full spectrum of tone that that pot should be giving you because it's reading at a weaker rating. And what happens is it takes out some of that high end that you really want from an electric guitar. Another thing to note about these cheaper import pots is that they won't have quite the same taper as the vintage pots. And that means as you roll the pot down, you're not going to get quite the same roll off as you do in the vintage ones. A key feature about that vintage taper that I've experienced with my vintage Gibsons is that you lose a huge percentage of your volume within the first quarter turn of the pot. This allows you to change really quickly between clean and driven tones, which I've heard is a huge part of what makes vintage Les Pauls so great. The third thing I realized is that in 2001, Gibson was using a much more modern wiring configuration. Now I'm not exactly sure what the specific differences are between a modern wiring configuration and a 50s wiring configuration, but what I read was that the effect is similar to a treble bleed, where most of the time, in any other wiring configuration, as you roll the volume pot down, you're also losing a lot of your high-end frequencies. If you have a treble bleed, or apparently if you have a 50s wiring harness, as you roll your volume pot down, more of those high frequencies will get fed back into it so that your tone can remain somewhat consistent as you're rolling the volume pot down. It doesn't quite work that way, but that's the intended effect. It actually ends up getting treblier, so when you're down between 1 and 5 on the volume pot, it can retain a lot of that spankiness. <laughs>
Now, I thought I read that burst bucker pickups, or at least certain years of burst bucker pickups, hadn't been wax potted directly from the Gibson factory. If you don't know, wax potting is a process that cuts down on the mechanical feedback of a guitar pickup, but it also cuts down on the harmonic resonance. Now you do this by taking a pickup and dipping it in a hot pot of wax until every component of the pickup has been soaked in that wax. This keeps any parts of the pickup from resonating against each other, which creates feedback. However, at the same time, you're also making the pickup less microphonic, which means it's going to pick up less of the acoustic frequencies from the wood of the guitar. So while I was tinkering around with my burst buckers, I ended up taking the pickups off and I discovered that mine had been wax potted. Which makes sense, I don't know if they were wax potted from the factory or if I had them wax potted after the fact, but they were in a hollow body guitar so they kind of needed to be wax potted anyway. But my goal for this Les Paul is to try to get as close to the vintage tone as I possibly can, which means I need accuracy. My search for vintage spec PAF reproduction pickups led me to a company called Throwback. And people, let me tell you, John Gundry knows just about everything there is to know about vintage pickups. I'd already been watching a few of his videos to talk about the burst buckers in my last video, and this guy gets down to the gnat's ass on these pickups, man. Now I'm talking from the tolerance of the wire gauge to the nickel composition of the screw poles. Now unless you subscribe to the idea that the magic of a PAF is greater than the sum of its parts, because then there really is no replicating a PAF pickup, throwback pickups are just about as close as anyone is going to get. I picked up myself a set of the KZLP115 PAF repros. And the crazy part about these things is that they were actually wound on a machine that sat in the Gibson factory in the 50s. What's even crazier is that when Gibson moved their factory from Kalamazoo, Michigan to Nashville, this machine was brought home by Les Paul himself. If you want to know more, I encourage you all to go check out John Gundry's videos at the Throwback Guitar Lounge on YouTube. The reason I picked up this particular set is because the KZLP115 machine is the machine that Gibson used in the early 50s to wind their P90 pickups. Once Gibson started manufacturing PAFs, this probably would have been one of the same machines that would have wound some of the earlier PAF humbuckers. Which makes sense since this is a 58 reproduction and that's probably what a 58 would have had. <laughs> Now if you guys are thinking that these pickups sound too good to be true, I am cheating just a little bit because I did happen to find someone who had some vintage PAF magnets for sale. Now I can't say for certain that both of these magnets were taken out of PAF humbuckers because vintage P90s use the same magnets, but I am certain that they are vintage magnets and they are the correct kind of magnets that should be in these pickups. 
Now, I don't have any kind of certificate of authenticity that states that these are for sure vintage magnets, but the reason I believe that they're vintage is because A, they look old, and B, they are far less magnetic than most modern magnets, which I've even noticed can help your guitar be slightly easier to play because it's putting less magnetic tension on the strings. And the last reason that I'm pretty confident that these are for sure vintage magnets is that I bought them from this guy named Mike Millerons, who I ended up talking to on the phone and found out that he's kind of an old timer in the vintage guitar buying and selling business. But anyway, I can't testify to this thing sounding like a vintage Les Paul. I personally have never gotten the opportunity to play a real 50s Les Paul Burst. But I can say that now, with its new wiring harness, its new pickups, and its new magnets, this thing definitely sounds like a vintage Gibson. Even though back in the early 2000s, Gibson was doing a pretty poor job of making their custom shop Les Pauls sound like the real deal, I have to give them props. Ever since this new CEO stepped in in 2018, they've been putting out some pretty banging shit. They've actually started manufacturing their own vintage spec oil capacitors and CTS pots. And I have to say, it makes a huge difference. So basically what I'm saying is it's a lot easier to find a Gibson Les Paul with many of these modifications already done to it. But I wanted to upgrade this one partly because of its sentimental value and also because it's one hell of a resonant guitar, which can be hard to find, especially in the middle of a pandemic when you can't go out and play other guitars. So anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you did, you might be interested in some of my other videos, so go check those out, and I'll catch you on the next one. Oh, god damn this thing is resonant.